Welcome back to the Aubergine Chef. Today we'll be making a Raspberry Bavarian Tort. And the Raspberry Bavarian Tort is actually uh, four separate components. The first component is the Vanilla Chiffon Genois Cake. And you can substitute that cake for your favorite kind of white or vanilla or yellow cake. Um, a pound cake would work well, for example. I like to use the Vanilla Chiffon Genois Cake with this because it's light and spongy and soft. It takes a little bit longer to make than your average cake, but I really like the way it tastes and the texture is really nice. Uh, the second component is the Bavarian cream. It's a raspberry Bavarian. And Bavarian cream is uh, typically is either a creme anglaise base, which we're going to use today, or a pate bomb base, which is those cooked eggs. Usually it's um, egg, egg yolks on the mixer. It's been stirring for a while or whisking for a while, and then you pour in a hot syrup. That's the second way of making it. We're going to make the creme anglaise base today, which is... From what I understand, it's more common in the United States to use a uh, creme anglaise based raspberry Bavarian. Um, then the third component is decorating paste, which we're going to make first. Um, decorating paste is a lot of fun to use. Um, basically, it's just a very simple dough, and you spread it thin on a silk pad or a silicone mat, and then you kind of just carve decorations into it. Um, and I'll show you what I mean by that. Um, you can color the decorating paste different colors, so that way you can make those designs uh, have some character to them. And then the final component is a raspberry miroir glaze, which is just simple, simply a fruit juice slash pulp gel gel that's been gelatinized or gelatinized. Um, so it's pretty simple. Uh, it's going to take us a little while because there is a freezing uh, portion of it because you want to make sure that the mousse is nice and frozen before we put the miroir glaze on top. So that way it doesn't rip up the mousse and get, uh, make our uh, Miroir glaze, miroir glaze cloudy. So like I said, the first thing we're going to make is our decorating paste, and it's pretty easy. Uh, we need four ounces of powdered sugar, which I already have on the mixer, and to that we're going to add four ounces of unsalted butter at room temperature and four ounces of egg whites at room temperature. And I know a lot of people tell you that your ingredients should be at room temperature for a lot of your baking components, but for the decorating paste, it's especially important because if it sets up, the, if it gets too cold, the butter will get hard and set up, and it will almost look curdled, and it won't spread very nicely. So if you need to, use the microwave on a lower temperature to warm all your ingredients up. And then you're also going to need four ounces of all-purpose flour and just a little bit of red food coloring for this tort. Of course, you can use any kind of food coloring you want. So let's go on over to the mixer. Okay, like I said, we're going to combine our powdered sugar, egg whites, and our butter. It's probably better if we cut up our butter in little small pieces, but that's okay. So once everything is nice and mixed together, at least broken up a little bit, we're going to go ahead and add in all of our flour. This is our four ounces of all-purpose flour, and we're going to mix that on low speed until it forms a paste. Now if you need to kick it up to a higher speed, feel free to. Okay, so our paste looks nice and pasty and pretty smooth and pretty consistent. So we're gonna go ahead and divide it up. We're gonna make break it up into about half and half. And you really need a little less red than you do need the uncolored batter, but um, breaking up into half and half is just fine. So that way you don't have to play this crazy mathematical guessing game. Now it's best if you let the decorating paste uh, hang out and rest at room temperature for about an hour. Um, you don't have to let it rest that long, but I'm going to go ahead and let it rest while I'm preparing the cake. And I use the gel food paste coloring, uh, same kind of coloring that you use to color icings. Okay, so the next recipe we're going to make is our vanilla chiffon genois cake. Uh, so in this bowl, I've already wiped out my electric mixer bowl with a little bit of vinegar, and that vinegar helps break up any excess fat residue that may be still lingering on the bowl, and a little bit of acid from vinegar helps the egg whites out too. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to basically just whip up a French meringue, uh, or a cold meringue. And I know a lot of times you see recipes and a lot of people have taught old school way of slowly adding in the granulated sugar as the egg whites whipping up. That's not really that necessary. Um, lots of food bloggers have experimented with it and they found that if you add the sugar to the egg whites and you whip it up immediately, there is no issue. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to go ahead and add in three and a half ounces of granulated sugar. So this looks pretty good. So when you can get some peaks like this, whoop, that's probably what, you're, what we're going to look for, because we don't want them too stiff, because if you make them too stiff, then they won't fold in very nicely. So we're going to go ahead and take this out, and then we're going to put in four and a half ounces of egg yolks. And then just like our whites, we're going to go ahead and add in three and a half ounces of granulated sugar. And I don't know if I mentioned how many egg whites were in there, but that was uh, four and a half ounces as well. So it's actually about five egg whites and about six egg yolks. Now, with the granulated sugar, when we add it to the egg yolks, we want to make sure, doubly sure, to get onto the mixer right away because the sugar can kind of cook the egg yolks and make them kind of uh, 
grainy and unpleasant. So we don't want that to happen. So the best way to avoid that is either to whisk it right away or put it on the mixer right away. All right, so once you've been whipping your egg yolks on the mixer with the sugar for a while on high speed, you're going to see it's going to get lighter and airier and fluffier and thicker. And what you're looking for is ribbon stage egg yolks. And ribbon stage egg yolks is when you can kind of stir it real quick and then pull it off the beaters. And you can build these ribbons on top of the yolks. Now these ribbons are supposed to hold their shape for about seven seconds before they completely disappear back into the yolks. I've got about six seconds here, so I'm not too concerned about that. I've got plenty of volume. I've got lots of volume in the whites, so I'm going to go on. Okay, so now we're going to go ahead and add in one and three quarters ounces of vegetable oil. You can do clarified butter too if you don't like vegetable oil. And we're going to do this while the mixer is on in a slow, steady stream. And we're going to try not to hit the mixer if we can because we don't want the whip attachment to fling our oil around. All right, so we guys look pretty good. Now, before we add in the next ingredients, um, while, they're, while the egg yolks are whipping up, you're going to have some time to weigh out your remaining ingredients. So in a separate bowl, you want to weigh five ounces of all-purpose flour and put an eighth of an ounce of baking powder in it. And then in a, in a ramekin, because it's a very small amount, um, three-quarters ounce of water with a quarter ounce of vanilla extract. And what we're going to do is we're going to add in half of the dry ingredients. Mix it on a very low speed. You can fold it in as well, but mixing it in works just fine. Half of the liquid. Then the remaining dry. And the remaining liquid. And then we're just going to mix that and scrape the sides of the bowl as necessary until it comes together into one mixture. Okay, so once our mixture comes together, with the flour and the liquid, or the dry ingredients and liquid, you'll see that it's gotten nice and thick. It's lost a little bit of volume, no big deal. We've got all those egg whites, which is what we're gonna do now. We're gonna fold in our egg whites a little bit at a time and take in about a third and go ahead and mix those in. And just before the streaks disappear, we're gonna add in the remaining, uh, another third and then the remaining third, the same kind of pattern. And the reason we break it up into thirds and the reason we fold it in is because we're trying not to break as many of these air cells as possible. That first little scoop probably lost a good amount of it because the mixture is so heavy. That second one's going to lose less because the first one lightened it up. Then the final one will lose the fewest amount of air cells because it's been lightened the most. All right, so you should have a light, fluffy uh, mixture now. So we're going to go ahead and pour it into our prepared cake pan. This is something, again, I did while my egg yolks were whipping up. Um, this is an 8 by 3 inch cake pan. Um, I've greased the sides and the bottom, and just stuck a little piece of parchment paper right in the center. It doesn't have to be a perfect circle. And we're going to go ahead and pour our batter in. And what we're looking for is just about halfway up the pan. This batter has a tendency to rise a lot because of all the air cells that we built. It looks like I'm going to be right on target. So if you don't have an 8 by 3 inch cake pan, don't feel like you have to run out and get one. You can do two 8 inch cake pans and just divide the batter up evenly. And now we're going to bake this at 300 to 350 degrees Fahrenheit uh, and for about 45 to 60 minutes or until the cake test's done. And you know, just stick a knife or a toothpick into the center of the cake. If it comes out pretty clean, or clean I should say, then uh, your cake is finished. All right, so while our cake is baking, we can go ahead and work on our decorating paste because it does need some time to chill. Um, remember, I just let this rest for as long as it took me to make the cake, so not very long. Um, and what we're going to do is on a silt pad or a silicone mat, silt pad is just the brand name, so it's no big deal. And uh, go ahead and pour this on. And I'm doing the opposite side because my I store my silt pad um, rolled up and it just uh, lays flatter upside down. So we're going to go ahead and put our red decorating paste. Okay, get as much of that red decorating paste as we can on there. And I want a nice border. I don't want to go all the way to the edge. So I'm going to use the silt pad's border as a guide and just spread it evenly and thinly right up into that border so you can't see that border or that the beige part, I guess. At this point, you can draw squiggles or whatever you want into the side because we're going to freeze it and then put the next layer on top while it's still frozen, and that way it'll hold its shape. Uh, for this cake, I'm going to draw nice lines. And so I got this tool from the hardware store because I couldn't find a cake comb that I liked. 
and it has this little edge right here. I'll try and use that and see if I can create, best as I can, freehand uh, nice straight lines. Now, my chef in school, he had a huge cape comb, and so he just went like that, and it was just done. So mine will probably not be as straight as his, but we'll make it work as best as we can. And then in between each line, I go ahead and scrape it into your bowl. All right, and now you can see why I said you don't need as much red as you do need white, because the white fills in the gaps and then puts a nice layer on top, so that way it's a nice uh, consistent layer. Uh, or cohesive, or uh, just a whole piece. So what we're going to do is we're going to freeze this for about an hour, and then by the time this is frozen, our cake should be done, and then we'll bake this. Okay, our cake came out of the oven just a little while ago. I just want to show you real quick how much it um, rose. You can see that it rises quite a bit. So you remember it was only about halfway in there, so it fits just just right in this cake pan. It, it, it does go down just a little bit. Once it's, when it's baking, it puffs up a little bit. Okay, so our decorating paste is nice and firm. So we're going to go ahead and put on our next layer, which is our uncolored paste. And we kind of want to move quickly because you know it's cold so this is going to cause this paste to set up as well okay even if you can't go all the way to the end that's totally fine we have we're going to get some good strips here um, we're going to make them into two and a quarter inch strips so you can imagine that we can get quite a few of those out of there and all we really need is about two maybe two and a half good ones so we're going to go ahead and bake this for about seven minutes between 325 and 400 degrees it's going to bake very quickly and so you want to make sure you keep an eye on it and it should just set up it shouldn't be hard like a cracker because we want it to be flexible so you know touch it lightly after about seven minutes just to check just to feel the texture if it's sticky you know leave it in if it's still doughy leave it in but if you notice that it's baked and even if it's just a little bit baked, take it out because what's going to happen is the carryover cooking is going to cook it the rest of the way. So you're going to kind of have to use your best judgment here and I'll show you as best as I can what you're looking for. All right, so it just came out of the oven right about seven minutes and you can see that it's gotten pretty dry and spongy. It's not really sticking to my finger. That's a very good sign. It stuck to my finger a little bit over there so it must mean that it was a little bit thicker over here. So we're going to just rely on carryover cooking to finish it the rest of the way. So I'm going to go ahead and let this cool off completely, maybe about 15 minutes. Okay, so now we're going to make our raspberry Bavarian cream. Now I've already whipped up nine and three quarters ounces of heavy cream in the mixer bowl. And I'm going to set that aside. You don't have the refrigerator or anything like that. Just put it to the side. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take this small little pot right here and it's got one and a half ounces of water in it and to that we're going to add three eighths ounce of granulated gelatin or powdered gelatin and then we're going to let it hydrate just for a minute or two just to kind of soak in that water and then we're going to put it on a low heat very very low to melt it we don't want to bring it to a boil we just want to melt it down so that way we don't see any of those greens and you can already see it's already soaked up all that water Meanwhile, you want to take about four egg yolks, which is about three ounces of egg yolks, and bring it and whisk it with one and a half or one and a quarter ounces of granulated sugar, just to mix it all up. And then you also want to have five ounces of whole milk and one and a quarter ounces of granulated sugar coming to a boil on the stove. And that should be everything we need, except I forgot to mention that we have five ounces of raspberry puree here. I made this fresh, well, quasi fresh. I used frozen raspberries. And I used about 12 ounces of raspberries to get about 8 ounces of puree. We only need about 5 ounces. So I'm going to need to get a little bit more puree for the miroir glaze later. Or you can water it down or put juice in it or whatever. I'm going to use all raspberry. Um, and so we're going to use 5 ounces for the raspberry Bavarian cream. Okay, so once your milk comes to a boil, you want to temper your egg yolks. And this prevents them from curdling or cooking. And all we're going to do is, and I'm really bad at using my left hand here, but... We're going to slowly drizzle in just a little bit of the milk at a time. And this is going to allow the yolks to reach the temperature of the milk, of course, without cooking. You're going to put your egg yolk and milk mixture back into the pot, and we're going to slowly cook this until it reaches about 180 degrees, or until it becomes thick and it coats the back of the spoon. Be careful, though, because it can scramble and get really thick, um, and you're not looking for that. You're just looking for a, like a soupy custard. Um, it's just going to be just thick enough. And before you go back onto the stove, you want to make sure you have a nice bath ready. Um, I'm going to have two separate bowls ready and a sieve 
just in case I do scramble it just a little bit. It's always good to be prepared. And meanwhile, I am melting down my gelatin and it's almost melted. We won't need it right away, but it, you know, you just keep it on a very, very low heat and just keep it melted. Okay, so it looks like our creme anglaise is pretty much ready. Um, it's gotten nice and thick and you can see how it coats the rubber spatula pretty well. All right, so we're gonna take this off the heat and we're gonna put this into an ice bath. Okay, and then the reason for the ice bath is just to make sure to cool down the creme anglaise as quickly as possible so we can use it sooner and to make sure that it doesn't continue to cook. So I have my makeshift ice bath here with a couple ice packs and some water. Uh, I don't usually have ice in my refrigerator or freezer because it's such a premium for space in there. And while it's cooling off, we can go ahead and add in our raspberry puree and that will help cool it down as well. After it's cooled down to about room temperature or so, we're going to go ahead and strain it to get any excess seeds out and to get those little bits of curdled egg out. And it's always a good idea to strain it anyway, even if you think you've made the perfect creme anglaise. Straining helps with the texture as well, I find. So use the finest sieve you have, or a very, very fine sieve, I should say. Okay, so you can see that we strained out a quite a bit of that gunk in there, a lot of this curdled eggs from the creme anglaise. And there's even some little bits of yolk that cooked from the sugar. And then once you've strained it, you want to switch spatulas to a clean spatula. You don't want to use the same spatula that had all that gunk on it. And we're going to scrape the bottom of the sieve because there's always a lot of custard that gets stuck to the bottom of the sieve, especially if it's very fine. Okay, our gelatin's nice and melted, but just in case there are bits that haven't melted completely, we're going to run it through a sieve to make sure we don't put any of those bits in there. Okay, once the gelatin's in there, go ahead and stir it in. And that gelatin's really going to help make sure that our cake is nice and sturdy and sliceable. We're going to go back onto the ice bath to continue cooling it down. We want it a little bit cooler than room temperature now because we want to fold in the heavy cream, and the heavy cream folds in best and loses the least amount of volume when the uh, product it's being folded into is cooler. Now that our mixture is nice and cool, we're going to go ahead and fold in our whipped cream. We want to do our best to lose as, many, uh, lose as few as air cells as possible because we want to make sure that this is nice and voluminous. So we're going to stir the first little bit in and just like how we did for the cake, we're going to do it in parts. So the next little bit and it's important that this is mixed together well, so make sure to check the bottom of the bowl and check for any of that raspberry creme anglaise that didn't get folded in. You can kind of switch back and forth to a rubber spatula to make sure that happens. Alright, we're going to just set this aside for a few minutes while we work on our decorating paste. Alright, so we're going to remove the decorating paste the same way that we would move like a tray of brownies. Put a piece of parchment paper on top, another sheet pan, flip the whole thing over. And then, very carefully, peel back the silicone mat. and then, then you have your decorating paste. Okay, the first thing we want to do with our decorating paste is make some clean edges. So we want to go through and cut off the bits that didn't get covered. Cut off the very edge. Try to make sure you have a nice flat bottom and then you want to measure two and a quarter inch strips. So we're going to mark it on either side. You can also mark it in the middle to help. and then cut that strip out as best you can. And then you can kind of use that as a template for the next piece. And just cut the next couple of pieces out. So now we can go ahead and start assembling our cake. First thing is first, is we're going to use an 8 inch cake ring. And that means that our cake is slightly too big for this cake ring because it's 8 inches. So I went ahead and cut down the cake to about 7 inches. I kind of just eyeballed it and I'll show you what that looks like. You also want to make sure you cut out a cake circle, a cardboard cake circle, so that it fits into the, card, into the cake ring without coming out. Now you can use a removable bottom, a pan, a springform pan, those kind of things. Things that you can 
get things out easily without having to flip the whole thing over. You don't want to flip this over after you've assembled it, basically. So here's the cake. Um, I did cut it into thirds because it was very tall. So each layer is about three quarters of an inch because I trimmed the top and a little bit off the bottom and the sides because it gets that brown crusty effect going on and I don't want that to kind of ruin the appearance of the cake. It's okay if you have it, it's not going to hurt anything. And so I'm going to save that extra third layer for something else, another project snack or whatever. And then we're just going to use two layers for this. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to put in our first layer. Now if you want, you can soak the layers with um, simple syrup, like an almond simple syrup or an amaretto simple syrup. You can spread a layer of raspberry jam on top to kind of just boost the flavor of this cake if you want. There's no, you don't have to, you, there's no obligation to do it whatsoever. It'll still come out fine. So then after you get your first layer in, let's go ahead and put in our strips. We need about 26 inches of decorating paste to go around the edge of the cake ring. So let's take a look and see. How oh, that's going to work. All right, so you can see that we're going to have a little bit of overlap. So keep in mind where it's overlapping and just cut that part off. And then if you were a little bit off, you can kind of just piecemeal it back together. After you've assembled your raspberry Bavarian, it's going to be a little fluid, so use the ladle to work with it. And we're going to put it into a piping bag. And the only real reason we're using a piping bag is because we want to get into that crevice that's between the decorating paste and the cake. Hopefully you can see this because I can't really move it too, too much. But if you can see how it sticks out just a little bit. So we want to make sure to get down in there. And the best way to do that is with the piping bag. So we can stick the piping bag right into that crevice and fill it up. And that is important because this is going to be the glue that holds this Bavarian cream. Is the glue that holds the decorating paste with the cake. Or to, to, to the cake, I should say. Okay, and once you've gotten that, then you can squeeze everybody out and have a nice party. Okay, put another big scoop of Bavarian cream on, smooth it down, and then you're going to put your next layer on top, and then you're going to squish it down. And when you squish it down, you want to get that next layer of, uh, or you want to get that layer of Bavarian cream up the side, so you don't have to use the piping bag again. Once you've gotten that, you're almost done. Now we just got to put the rest of the cream into the cake pan. You want a very, very, very small amount of space in between the uh, top of the cake ring and the uh, Bavarian, so that way we have space for the uh, mirror glaze. But it doesn't have to be a huge amount. So we can probably put the rest of the cream on top. Try to get the Bavarian cream as smooth as you can on top. Put your cake on a sheet pan. So it's easy to transport, and then you're going to freeze it for about 3-4 hours or overnight. Make sure that wherever it's freezing on is level, because you don't want your cake to be accidentally uh, slanted. Okay, the last step is to make some miroir glaze. Now this is, this is probably going to be just enough for us to use. Usually I like to make a little bit more, but I didn't have as much uh, raspberry puree as I was expecting, and I didn't want to get into the bag. So we're going to try and make this work. I've got three ounces of raspberry puree here, um, basically left over from the ra uh, raspberries I used for the uh, mousse, or for the Bavarian cream. And then in this pot, I warmed up two ounces of water with an eighth of an ounce of gelatin. And that's all Miroir glaze is. So we're going to go ahead and add that in. Now, of course, you could use juice to kind of thin it out and add a little bit more flavor. You don't have to use water. All right, so here is our solidly frozen cake. You can see that it's totally frozen. And we're going to go ahead and pour on our glaze. We only want a really thin layer, um, but we can use all of it if we want. And then we just want to rotate it around to make sure it's evenly spread. Okay, and I could probably have used a little bit more. The biggest issue right now is that the edges the closest to the ring were a little bit taller than the middle. So that's why I'm getting a little bit of that dip right there. So we're going to try and see if we can spread it out. So anyway, um, we're going to let it sit for about 15 minutes at room temperature for the miroir glaze to set up. And then we're going to release it from its mold. All right, so it's been about 15 minutes at 
room temperature didn't do anything much. I just kept swirling it around until it cooled down since I had those, you know, those peaks. If you make it nice and flat like you're supposed to, you wouldn't have to worry about it. So, okay, we're going to release it now. So we're going to use a can. Uh, I'm using this little plastic gelato uh, container. Lift it up, put it on top, and center it, and then you're just going to slowly slide it down. If you have any issues, you can use a um, blowtorch to loosen the sides, but hopefully we won't have any issues. And there you go. So that came off. Let's take a look around the side of our cake. So right here, we had a little bit of a crack in our side, so that's what's going on over there. So far everything looks pretty clean. Don't have to do any cleaning on the side, really. Sometimes what happens is that little strip of mousse that we have, I like that extreme ex uh, exposed strip of mousse. We did that in school too. Let's move that out just a little bit. Um, and uh, sometimes what will happen is it'll drag down and it will kind of stain the sides. And you can see where the uh, tool wasn't super good at making those nice, nice, clean edges. And you'll see it in the pictures because the pictures can't hide it. So like right here. So that the tool wasn't perfectly flush with the sill pad. So we got a little bit of the red mixed into there. But otherwise it looks fine. I really like it because it looks kind of like a circus tent. Here's a trick that I learned at the uh, grocery store I worked at. Take a little bit of corn syrup on this gold board, and that's going to act like glue since we don't have any icing or anything, and that'll hold it in place. Otherwise, it'll just be sliding around. Let's see if we can get some nice clean slices out of this. So the best thing to do with a mousse cake especially is to have a really hot knife, and you can do this by putting it under some hot, hot water. Dry it off, and let's pick a spot. I'm going to use that crack and see if I can't line it up with the crack that I made. I'm going to go straight down. Oh, that wasn't a very straight cut, now was it? And there you can see all of our layers, the cake, the mousse, and of course the decorating paste. And again, there's our finished slice of the Raspberry Bavarian tort. Alright, so that's how they make the Raspberry Bavarian cake or the Raspberry Bavarian tort. There's a lot of areas where you can customize. Remember that the vanilla chiffon genoise cake can be replaced with pretty much any kind of yellow cake. Um, then you can use a little simple syrup that's been flavored to give extra flavor to the cake. You could do, um, you could soak it with like an amaretto, for example. Um, you can put layers of raspberry jam before you put the mousse on top, so that way you have little extra bursts of raspberry flavor on the layers of cake. And you can put juice or some kind of other liquid other than water in the miroir glaze to add extra flavor as well. And keep this decorating paste uh, recipe handy, especially if you're like really artistic. Not like me, I'm not artistic at all. But if you're artistic, you can really do some really neat things with decorating paste, because you, if you can draw it, you can pretty much make it into paste. So anyway, I hope you learned a lot today. Thank you for watching, and remember, the aubergine chef, demystifying dessert, one recipe at a time.